Well, here we go. The text for this morning's sermon is the first verse in the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus. My father was born in January of 1917. And when he was born, the universe seemed pretty big, certainly bigger than Paul thought it was. It seems that Paul thought that the earth was flat and there was a dome over the earth. And, you know, the reason there was blue sky was because that was supposed to be water that was above the dome up there. And, uh, God open the windows of heaven and let the water in, that kind of thing. At least we think that that's essentially what Paul thought. So in 1917, the world was certainly a bigger place than Paul thought it was. <clears throat> but then it got a lot bigger. Later that year, Hubble figured out that Andromeda, that little smudge, was another entire galaxy. But now, all of these years later, we believe there are a hundred billion galaxies. The universe is enormous. And it really does call into question some of the ways in which the Bible talks about God's order and God's way of doing things, the purpose of creation, as it were. It's the complexity of the universe the complexity of the way life has evolved and unfolded that call things into question. I mean, really, given the enormity of the universe, is it reasonable to say that God created human beings, the idea being that he would have a companion or companions that would live in relationship to him uh, based on a set of rules or a structure of laws that he set forth? that human beings were to give their allegiance and their love to God, and then God's love would come into the human life and uh, move beyond them to one another so that they had a gathered, unified, and loving community. Is it reasonable to suggest then that this God who created us for this companionship purpose, for this unity, becomes so upset when we break the rules that it's necessary for this God to become a human being, Jesus, and die on a cross to satisfy God's, uh, I don't know, bloodlust, uh, sense or desire for justice that would take place this way. Is that a reasonable assumption? I, I think at this point, given the enormity of the universe, it really does stretch credulity just too far. And that's what the modernist reconstruction has really done, or deconstruction has really done. It's, it's pulled apart these myths, this idea of the way the world works and how God looks at human beings and God's need for justice through the shedding of blood. I think that's why our churches are emptying. But the question comes, what does life look like? What does the universe look like without the sense of purpose and meaning and direction that this and other myths throughout the world gave to humankind. I think that for many people, the world looks like a confusing and hostile environment. It's random and disturbing. And when people try and figure out what it is that they're here for, eventually it just comes down to they're trying to live as long as they can, just as comfortably as they can. And morality? Well, there's no real basis or fundamental reason for morality outside of maybe enlightened self-interest. Or maybe we've been raised that way and we're in the habit of being moral. But there's no foundation for it exactly. Not once you've deconstructed any meaning in the universe or kind of have some sort of vague sense that there is spirit in the universe, but doesn't seem to have any real connection to us. 
And so you end up doing the best you can. You recognize that everybody else has their own point of view. And the trouble with everybody having a point of view is it's hard to determine whose point of view is first and second and third. And it usually ends up being that the one with the biggest gun is the one whose point of view is taken as uh, the one that's true. That's what it seems to look like when you've deconstructed any sense of meaning and purpose in the midst of the universe. And I think we make a mistake, a real mistake, just to write off the biblical conversation, a conversation that's been taking place over thousands of years, that is based on spiritual encounter and then describing those encounters in the best way people knew how from within their own worldview. That's what Paul was doing. He'd had a spiritual encounter. And he said he was an apostle, a messenger, somebody who would had this spiritual encounter and insight into God's purpose and meaning and direction for the universe. And God's will, God's order could be seen, he said, in Christ Jesus. Now, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. There's something much bigger going on here for Paul because he sees a cosmic unity in the structure of Jesus the Christ. He says things are unified. All things are unified. In another letter, he says, come into perfect harmony. So that's what Paul is seeing, a kind of cosmic order that is built in. And when we are in Christ, we are an expression of that order. We are living as a part of that order. That's what Paul would like us to understand about the nature of things. Of course, his idea of cosmic order, I mean, it's a much smaller cosmos than we're talking about now. But nevertheless, I think over the years, people have had spiritual encounters. I know that I do, spiritual encounters that lead us to believe that, yes, there actually is some purpose and direction to the way creation is unfolding, the way evolution is taking place. Paul's claim that would be that each one of us, living faithfully from within this sense of purpose and direction, in Christ is the way he would put it, is an expression of that creative urgency and power that is going to be uniting all things together in perfect harmony. That's what Paul would have us believe, and we're going to have to ask ourselves the question, is he right? Does our encounter with spirit lead us to believe that God does have a purpose for our lives, that the love of God is unfolding within each one of us, that each one of us does have something to live for and something to die for. Each one of us has an obligation to be living within that order so that it moves ever closer to that perfect harmony that Paul imagines that we all long for. The love of God is at work in the world. Now, I'd like to make it clear that I, I don't think that Paul or the Christian conversation is the only conversation on the face of the globe that is trying to reach out and understand the order that God has in the universe. That's not what I believe. In fact, what I think is that when I talk to people in other traditions who are, who are seeking to describe God's purpose and meaning in the universe in other ways, I, I find that it deepens my own understanding of my Christian way of doing that. So I'm not making an exclusive claim, but nevertheless, this is the pond that I swim in. And so over the next weeks and months, I'd like to go through this letter that Paul wrote or a disciple of Paul wrote that's trying to describe the order and the purpose of creation, trying to describe the love of God that lives within us forms us and unfolds into the future because of God's work within us. Each one of us has enormous value and beauty. Each one of us is alive for a reason. So I hope you will join me as we look through Paul's letter, trying to see what his spiritual encounter got him to point towards. We'll describe it our own way. We won't describe it the way he did. 
But nevertheless, we will seek to find what he was pointing towards so that the love of God can indeed form and inform us.